Kurt, we have uh, we're on the brink of a historic, historic event. Steph Curry, 16 threes away from passing Ray Allen as the all-time three-point shooter in the NBA. What are your thoughts? I, I don't think sometimes we stop and just appreciate often enough like how great Steph Curry is. Not just as a shooter, as a player, as a guy who's just helped change the NBA in a lot of ways. Like, I think sometimes we just kind of get locked into the, oh, the highlights of him knocking down another shot from the logo or whatever. <clears throat> His, he's such a gifted player. He's got such amazing handles. And I think what separates him from, from even a Ray Allen, who was a, obviously a legendary shooter, or, or a Reggie Miller or whoever you want to mention, he can shoot it off the catch or off the bounce. Like, whatever you want him to do, he is fully – he can bring it up and just pull up into something – he can beat a guy going, you know, a little bit left and just pull up, like, or he can work off the ball and catch. Like it, that versatility is something in a shooter I, it, that's really rare. I just love hearing um, earlier in the season, uh, Reggie Miller was talking about getting dinner with Steph, and he said we've been trying to get this uh, on TV. He's like, we've been trying to get this dinner between me, Steph, and Ray. Which, by the way, yeah, wow. That was Whoa. Could you hey, imagine sitting down and just can I be the a, waiter? Can I just yeah, yeah. being a fly, just being a, like adjacent on a table just near them? But Reggie was was talking to Kevin Hart and just talking about, hey, uh, I want I'm so curious just to talk shop, just to understand what do you do in the off season? You know, uh, what what is your footwork like? And I thought that kind of nuance, just understanding the 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 skill set required to be uh, the all time leading or in the top three. I mean, this is like a science. This is this is mastery on another level where, you know, you could geek out for two hours about footwork coming off of screens, you know, <laughs> like that level of dedication to the craft uh, to me is just what separates Steph Curry. And of course, to the fact that, I mean, it seems like he's just getting better, Kurt. I mean, like before his record was 13 made three pointers in a game. Guess what? This season, he's had how many 10-point records, uh, 10 made threes in a game? He just keeps elevating himself every year, and that's scary. And they've done – a part of it is he gets to win, so we get to see him on these big stages. The Warriors have done – when we talk about changing the game, it's not just Steph Curry's unbelievable skill and, and the gravity he has that just pulls defenders to him. You've got to send two guys to him. 30 feet from the basket or, or you might, he might just knock it down, but the Warriors found a good system to exploit that. And it's something they didn't really do the last couple of years as well. When they had different players and younger guys, like, if they get it to Draymond is the master of the short role. He gets that ball and he gets to the right at the nail, gets to that free throw line and he can distribute or score. Uh, they've got shooters everywhere. Obviously you got secondary shot creators like Clay Thompson when he's healthy, just the quality around him, to take advantage of what he does and the system Steve Kerr put in is brilliant, but it's still all predicated on the fact Steph Curry just warps your defense. There's just like, he just throws everything out of whack. Yeah. He's unstoppable. <laughs> it's just full yeah. stop. Like that, that's the end of the sentence. Steph Curry's unstoppable. Now the question is how many games will it take to break the record, right? It's inevitable. Uh, the yeah. question is, is, it gonna be, is he going to get uh, 16 in one game? Or is it going to take a couple of games? Either way, I can't wait for the confetti because we know it, it's one of those things, Kurt, where it's, it's just amazing to me. Like when you get to watch history being made, much like when we watch Tom Brady, you know, just cement his legacy as the greatest of all time. He just keeps winning Super Bowls. Right. And he's somehow in his 40s is, is still playing at an like an unstoppable level. Like we're witnessing that un unfold. Steph Curry, we all know he's the greatest shooter to ever live, right? So it's one of those things where now we're watching him just assume that position that we we've seen for like for years now, you know. It's but it's it's nice to see him get that recognition in the, in the record books. And I think the recognition sometimes it's a little slow to come from the the old heads, right? Like the, the some of the guys, but I I don't think you get that. Like Ray Allen, Reggie Miller, you know, the TNT guys, all those guys. Everybody's on board now. Like no, it's Curry, man. Curry's Curry's the best shooter ever. It's not even like up for debate. Yeah, and and he's only he's only in his early early thirties. Like the way that yeah. the the guys are playing. I mean, you think about how many like just what that number could be. I mean, that's that's a daunting figure, Kurt. I mean, that's like how long will that record stand? Yeah, and he's gonna. By the way, he's gonna break Ray Allen's three point record. It's a different era. I'm gonna grant you this. He's gonna do it in more than 500 fewer games. 
Like, just it's ridiculous. But it's one of those things, too, where you got to wonder the way that Trey Young is playing, the way that these young guys are playing. Yeah. If, if Steph Curry could half Ray Allen or Reggie Miller's record, and as far as games are concerned, yeah. Are we going to see a time where you get in 200, 300 games, you tie Steph Curry, you know, in, in a decade's time? That's a pretty scary prospect to just understanding what the game looks like. And even just as far as a different record, too, if it swings back to the way it looks right now, where the interior game is starting to, to dominate again, yeah. guys like Embiid, guys like Jokic, thinking that they might take a crack at some of the best centers records to ever play, you know, in fewer games. Like, it's just kind of cool to yeah. see uh, the way that the game evolves over time as far as records are concerned. Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to see a huge drop-off in three-point shooting just because the league has kind of come to realize, you know, the complex math that three is worth more than two. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to keep shooting them because it just the math makes you. But I, I think you will see the pendulum swing a little bit. Teams will get better at defending it, and you'll have to go to other shots. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to watch, but somebody eventually will. I don't you know Trey Young is interesting, but he's never been as consistent as you could. Devin Booker is knocking it down from 40% from three this year. It is a tremendous shooter, but honestly, he's not been a great, great three point shooter until this season, but somebody's going to come up. I mean, he's everybody who's 13 right now has grown up watching Steph Curry, wanting to be Steph Curry, owning a Curry Jersey. And some guys are going to come through. And just be crazy. Some, some high school, some college guys. You, you have a way with words, Kurt. I, I, I love I love the way you threw it out there just now and laid it out. So now let's move to another a great shooter, Damian Lillard. You know, yep. it, I feel like if you talk Portland, you have to talk Dane, right? He is the engine that makes that team go. Although right now, uh, the, there's some there's some bumps in the road for that for that car. Uh, Neil O'Shea is fired. Now there's a GM search. How will these pieces fit together knowing that you have to keep Dame happy or he might leave? Yeah, bumps in the road. I think they, they, I, I, I'm trying to decide if the term dumpster fire or tire fire is actually a more accurate. <laughs> well, I was trying to be delicate. <laughs> I was trying to be delicate. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a problem out there. And it doesn't help now that, that Dame is out with the abdominal injury that's bothered him, as you know, since Tokyo and, and kind of slowed him a little there. And now uh, CJ McCollum's going to be out for probably a couple weeks with a, a collapsed lung. Like it's, mm -hmm. they've had a rash of bad luck on top of the other problems that they already had. I, I to me, they have reached the, 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 Oh, one of the great secrets to winning in the NBA is great ownership and having an owner who look, Paul Allen was this way. I, I mean, the Holtz in San Antonio, you, you know, we're, probably one of the best at this work. They were involved. They asked questions. They challenged people. They put in processes. But at the end of the day, the basketball people make the basketball decisions, right? Like you, you want to be knowledgeable about it. But at the end of the day, because you started a tech company does not make you a basketball expert, right? Like you, you let the guys who do the basketball make. But there comes ownership decision points in a franchise. And I think Portland is there now. And it's really simply, do we retool this thing around Dame Lillard, get him healthy, maybe have to trade CJ McCollum and Nurkic to go get Ben Simmons or go get some of those guys from Indiana or some combination or whatever it's going to be, retool this thing and make a run with Dame Lillard? Or do we hit the reset button and, and start over? And that's that's an ownership level decision. That falls on Jody Allen. And and I'm curious, I th and, and the, the next GM who comes in for her, but like that's that's to me where they are. They have to decide. I would personally rebuild. I, I would I would keep Dame and go like Dame. Guys like that don't you just don't get franchise guys like that. Like to me, you, I I take another run at it, but that's where they are to me. Like it's decision time for that organization because it, I don't want to say this season is lost, but it's a mess right now. It's yeah. It's it's hard to to cut bait twenty something games in the season. But yeah. man, <laughs> and yeah. like you said, the, 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 the tough part about this team is remember Nurkic in the bubble, they had a yeah. chance, they looked decent. And then next thing you know, injuries come. And then, like you said, a collapsed lung for CJ McCollum. I hope he, he, he feels better. And is a able football to play injury. Soon. Yeah. This, I mean, this, it's just, it's really, it's really tough uh, when you think about, okay, well, how do you move forward as a team? So the, the thing here is let, let's just lay it all out there. Right. 
Lillard's play this season has been subpar to what we we've grown accustomed to seeing him play. And, and think about this too. In recent years, I think Lillard's done a very good job maturing into a player that one could really build a franchise around. Like you know, just he's elevated his game every single year. Uh, and in that sense, it's pretty amazing to watch him do his thing. Now, at the end of the day, the question it becomes. Can you build a successful player uh, franchise around Damian Lillard? And that's what this next GM is going to have to figure out. If so, then what pieces around them? You tried Nurkic. You had one of the best two guards in the game in CJ McCollum, who's vastly underrated still. I yeah. still don't know how we we do this, but every year I'm just like, why why don't we give McCollum more respect? He's one of the best two guards uh, in the game. But anyways, like what else do you need around him? You had Mello coming off the bench as like, you know, that six man of the year type of concept. That wasn't enough. Uh, so I'm curious from your perspective, you would rebuild with Dame. What pieces does he need around him to elevate that team from a playoff contender to a real championship contender? Uh, the reason I brought up Ben Simmons is that he fits a couple of things I think they need, which is. Again, Dame Lillard and CMH David McCollum to me were one of the best backcourts in the NBA. They're six foot and six one. And then they brought in Norman Powell in a whopping six four to play the three. It's too small. It's just too small for today's NBA. If you've got to go up against Curry, who's six four, and and Clay, who's six seven, like you just run into too much size. Um, and I think that that's where and their defense has never been great. Ben Simmons answers those questions. I don't, not completely that you're going to have to do a lot more, but to me, I think you've got to get size and a little more, you know, CJ brought the shot creation. You're going to need to replace that. And you're going to need bigs who can step out. I think you, you've got to get some defensive guys in there. I, it's, it's not a simple process, which is why I think it's an interesting to question. And the other part of that is, you know, we were just, we've talked earlier about, Hey, Steph Curry is at his age, keeps playing. LeBron's 37 and putting up numbers. Durant's 33. I mean, guys are playing really effectively. So into their mid-30s, if you believe Dame can be one of those guys, can get healthy from this thing and do that, then fine. But if you're concerned that he's an undersized guard, you know, he's six, he's six foot. He's strongly built. He stays in shape, but he's not huge. And he plays a style where he goes attacking, right? Like he goes into the rim. If you're worried that his game isn't going to age well, it's got to impact your long-term decision. I, again, I'd rebuild around him. I think he'll be back to be, I think you can get him to back to being that guy, but you got to put some size and more shooting around him and, and a little more defense and see what happens. And we look at his contract right now is due to make base salary of just over 39 million this year, then 42 million next year, 45 million. He's 34 making 48, almost 49 million. Then he's an unrestricted free agent, 2025. Uh, Adrian Wojnarowski reported that he's looking to sign a, a contract extension, maybe in the ra range of 50 plus million dollars a year. Uh, those numbers were similar to what James Harden turned down in Houston. You know, when I look at what is successful, right? If you're going to allocate, 50 million dollars to one player right which is a lot of money let's just throw yeah, that out there. that's Corey robinson money that's oh, no, that's <laughs> kurt that's kurt money right there <laughs> but when we think about when we think about that kind of allocation at the end of the day you gotta say what am i getting back for this right and i think as a gm that's a very hard question to, to answer because it's not about just you know talent it's not just about skill there's there's this element of like okay what has been successful in recent years i think we're still in this kind of weird area, Kurt, where the teams that won, you know, the, the Golden State Warrior DNA blueprint of like a Steph, yeah. Clay, Draymond, and Andre Iguodala, like that doesn't necessarily seem to be working in the past recent years. When you think about the best teams have an Anthony Davis, you know, have have a big man who can do everything you know. for you. It's almost like I said, a, a bringing you back to the 90s where you had Hakeem and, you know, my dad, Tim Duncan, you had all these guys like that uh, ruling the NBA. We're starting to see, just look at the MVP front runners. You know, it's all Giannis, it's all Jokic, it's all Embiid, it's Anthony Davis type of players. And then players like a, a Curry or players like a Damian Lillard in this instance are more like, they're the two they're the two guy, right? And that's why I'm curious to see this Warriors team. If they can make a run for it, then my theory will be upended, right? And you can actually still win with a guy like Curry being your main guy. But the new GM of the, the Portland Trailblazers have to figure out, are we still in, can Damian be like Steph? And are we going to have success like that? Or do we need to shift and say, hey, 
DeAndre Aiden, Chris Paul, that got them to the finals. Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell got them to the number one seed for the vast majority of the season last year. And you know, like, you, you see what I'm saying, yeah. Kurt? Yeah. It's a very, it's the, a hard question. It, it is a very hard question. And I think what also has to factor into this, and it's not the fun stuff that you and I and everybody debating sports likes to discuss. Damian Lillard fills seats, brings in sponsors, gets people to watch games. And there's a, it's an entertainment business. It is still a business. And I, I remember late in Kobe's career when Kobe was well past his prime and they were paying him gobs of money, right? Then he wasn't quite the same player. And I'm like, that's a lot of money for Kobe Bryant. And somebody with Lakers kind of casually was like, he brings in four times that to at least to this organization because people tune in to watch Kobe. Kobe, you know, like, and Kobe's kind of a, a little unique in some ways, but Dame is the face of the franchise right there. If you rebuild, how will the fan base take that? I mean, this is Portland loves its trailblazers. That is a passionate fan base. But are, do you lose sponsorship money? There is a whole business decision that ties into that as well. Um, it's it's not a simple. We'd like to think of it in just purely basketball terms, but it, it's bigger than that. So let's think about another team here that might have to rebuild Indiana Pacers. Talk about another state that loves basketball. Yes. So that team, what would you do if you were the GM of the Pacers right now? First off, they've just been unlucky in a lot of ways. I mean, the funny thing is that they've outscored their opponents this year. They have a positive net rating and they're 10 and 16. They should be more like 14 and 12, like based on the stats, but they just, they are, uh, last time I looked, I think they're three and 11 in games within five points in the final five minutes. They just, they can't close close games and it's a tough spot. If they're going to rebuild, I find it, first off, I just find it interesting because ownership there has never signed off on that. They've always kind of, like not even rebuilt on the fly. Like, Hey, we're going to re-sign Darren Collison and we're going to re-sign all these good stars to kind of slightly larger contracts to keep them. And if we are, you know, the sixth seed and we get bounced in the first round, so be it like that. They thought that that was the path to success for them and, and keeping the fan base engaged. They seem up for a genuine rebuild this time. Like a, not down to the studs process, but, being bad, they're not going to be good for a couple of years, and that's okay. I think that's fine if you're selling hope and you get some good young players back there. Uh, I think that they – look, there's real interest out there in Miles Turner. There's real interest in in Sabonis. Uh, Karis LeVert would get a lot of interest. Uh, Brogdon can't be traded this year, but beyond this season, if they really go this route, Brogdon and guys like TJ McConnell, who's now probably out for the year with an injury, but – could be traded down the line. So, like, if you're going to do this, there's a lot of good players that te other teams will have real interest in. What's interesting to me is also that the biggest names, the, the Brooklyn, the Lakers, like, what are they going to trade? Like, they would love to get Karis LeVert. They don't have any first-round picks left, right? Like, they've moved so much talent to get the players they have. It's going to be interesting to see who can step forward. Chicago might be a really interesting landing point. And it's a mid-market area, too. You think about free agency destination. But let's yeah. just think about the Pacers when they remember when they went all in, Oladipo. Yeah. Uh, and they tried to build around. It just never got through. He right. Didn't... It was never there. Then Malcolm Brogdon, who yeah, I think is, once again, you think about underrated players. Yeah. Yeah. We just no one talks about him. And, you know, I feel like. Brogdon to me was a lot like Tobias Harris, you know, you know, before Tobias went to the 76ers and people are like, you're paying him that much money. And then you realize, wait a second, he's playing alongside Embiid and not just holding his own, but is like almost a 50, 40, 90 player, you know, on the yeah. number one state team in the East. That's the kind of player Malcolm Brogdon has become. He's a very reliable, incredibly underrated player that just balls. Uh, but once again, that scenario being next to another underrated player that just balls. DeMontis Sabonis. It's not enough for Indiana. I, I'm i with you. I'm like, I don't know. What do you do with the scenario? Do you try to go after your big name, but then do you mortgage the franchise trying to do that? Are you trying to, you know, just barely squeak into the playoffs? Like, what does success look like? Because the current, the current roster is not a championship team. So no. you can figure out, like, what is the expectation? How do we get there? And, I mean, I love Sabonis. I love Brogdon. I mean, I really like Karis LeVert's game, too. Uh, but I just don't – I'm with yeah. you. It needs to shake up. I'm curious, too, if they would be willing to do something. Look, I don't think 
just throwing out names. Like, I don't think Damian Lillard makes a lot of sense for them, right? Like, he's 31, and even if he bounces back, like, that you, – you go right into win-now mode. I'm not sure that's where they want to go if they're going to break this thing up. But they might be an interesting partner for Ben Simmons suddenly. Ben Simmons is younger. He's on a four-year – you know, he's on a longer contract. You've got some time to build. You've got to kind of build a specific team around him because of because of his lack of shooting and some of the skill sets. But you could start to do that. You've got some good players. It'd be interesting to see what direction they go or if they just want to go into the draft and try to get picks. Um, it, it, it'll be interesting. I just think it's kind of time. They've just – They've been on the carousel for a while, just kind of in the middle. And I'm, I kind of like teams that would wrap, hey, well, we're going to take a step back to try to make a big leap forward rather than just kind of run in the middle of the pack. Yeah, and I mean, the way that, though, Ben Simmons is kind of the way he kind of, you know, is trying to force himself out of Philadelphia. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of the way that Odell tried to force himself out of Cleveland, right? Yeah. And they yeah. end up on the Los Angeles Rams roster. Uh, but on that roster, Kurt, who was there, you know? Cooper Cup, number one, the leading receiver in the yeah. NFL, you know, yeah. and, so, and and uh, Robert Woods. And so where does Odell fit on that roster? If you look, if we learn anything from adjacent sports leagues, I wonder what Ben Simmons will end up with. You know, if he if he ends up on a team, I don't know if he's, it's going to be like you're going to come in and be the franchise guy in Indiana or whoever else. It seems like it might be in the same same kind of scenario that he found himself in Philadelphia where, you know, you are playing next to a Cooper Cup level guy, you know? So, but with Indiana, yeah, it's, it's I, I like it too. try to go all the way. But the, the thing that we've seen as far as success, unless you're like a Utah, you know, where you have well, Donovan Mitchell. Well, Donovan Mitchell is a, a superstar, actually. So I take back. Yeah. You still need a player that elevates and transcends, you know, and, and is on that yeah. level where, look, there's only one Donovan Mitchell. There's only one Devin Booker. You know, there's only one, you know, all these great young teams that are coming up. To me, the Pacers' path is very similar to the Knicks' path, where Julius Randle is improving every year and he's becoming a franchise player, but he's not a Donovan Mitchell or Jason Tatum or you know a Luka Doncic or guy that you build um, a whole franchise around. That's for sure. Let's go after Giannis and do that, you know. Uh, and Malcolm Brogdon is that kind of guy for me, where I'm like every year I'm so impressed, but is he the franchise player? Is Sabonis the franchise player? You know, at the current moment, the answer has been no. It doesn't mean that they can't turn into that, but just right now, the answer has been no. No, and I, th for a mid-market team, if look, if you're not the Lakers or the Knicks or the Heat, and you want to get your your Luca, your Giannis Antetokounmpo, your your superstar, you kind of have to do it through the draft, right? Like you just, with all due respect to how great a state Indiana is, that's not where free agents are flocking in the NBA, and. They're gonna kind of have to do it themselves, which is a shame because I hear there's a great football team in Indiana. It's a great state. I hear that as well. <laughs> so, so let's think about some big trades, Kurt. Uh, what could be the biggest shakeups as we head into um, the trade deadline? I think Indiana opened up the door a lot. Like right, like that's the suddenly, that's a really interesting set of trades. If Sabonis and I think people sleep on how good a defensive player Miles Turner is and, and could yeah. really dominate in the right situation. After that, it's uh, assuming I'm not even going to touch the Lillard or Ben Simmons situation, although the Simmons situation is a little of a, uh, it's a little bit of a dam on the, the process for lack of a better word. There's a lot of teams waiting to see what happens. And while they wait, nothing else is getting by. Um, eventually that, that the, the waters will flow and, and things will break out. Um, Sacramento is going to be a seller. I think I, there's a lot, look, they tried to move Buddy Heald in the off season. He was almost dealt to the Lakers. A lot of teams are going to call them though, and ask about Harrison Barnes, which will be interesting because mm. he's playing sneaky really well <laughs> down in Sacramento. And if Sacramento's realizing they're not going to make the playoffs and maybe realizing that their plan to build something around De'Aaron Fox isn't going to work as well as they hoped, they might be willing to take picks in young players and kind of retool it a little bit. We'll see. Um, but they could be sellers. Um, the other one to watch is your San Antonio Spurs. Uh, Thaddeus Young has not only mentioned he wants out, but it's a good small ball five that could help a lot of teams. Could help a lot of teams in you know. You know you don't want to end. There's a lot of teams that watched what happened to Utah and watched Rudy Gobert struggle against the five out lineups, and I think Utah's adapted that. But a lot of teams saw that and said, "We got to have a small ball center," and Thaddeus Young can be that guy for you. All things to look out for. 
And last but not least, before we wrap it up, Kurt, um, so there's a new vaccination rule affecting teams. So uh, Toronto is now, uh, after January 15th, unvaccinated players cannot travel to Toronto. The, the vaccination rates in the NBA, 97%, 60% have received their booster shots. Uh, but it is important to know, I just want to get your thoughts on this new rule. Uh, they, it's a Canadian government rule, first off. This wasn't an NBA thing for people who don't know this. And it's not just the NBA. Like NHL players can't won't be able to travel to Edmonton or Calgary or and, and type of stuff, too. Um, it, I'm not sure that this particular part of the rule is going to have a huge impact on the NBA, only because, I mean, you, well, we're not sure who the unvaccinated players are. Like you said, there's not that many of them. And even the high-profile ones, Kyrie's not even with the team. Washington's already been to Toronto twice. They don't go back north of the border. Uh, Michael Porter Jr. isn't playing. Like I, I'm not sure who how much it's going to really impact NBA games. We'll see. If, you know, we'll kind of find out. But I, I'm not sure it's going to do much. Um, I think concerns about increased te- look. They're increasing testing. Concerns about the Omicron virus that are hitting you and me, and you know, has a lot of concern going on around the nation. Um, that's going to be the thing to watch. I, I'm curious, like they've upped the testing and suddenly you're seeing more guys go into the protocols. And I think that you're going to have to see a league being a lot more careful as much as they can. Just, I think we're all dealing with this, right? It's, it's winter. Everybody's indoors. It's, it's all a little, we're all trying to protect ourselves from a surge, I guess. But just something that the league and, the, and its players you know, have to account for. But like you said, 97% of the players are vaccinated. This only applies to a, a select few. Uh, but it is important to note. Yeah, and I, by the way, I was impressed with the uh, the sixty percent with the boosters already. That's a that's a good sign. 